Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. The Flames have finally hit the halfway point of the 2017-2018 season. And as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. And whether it's the halfway point or the full point, we're here to talk Flames hockey. Matt, it's been a good week. Flames have beaten two teams right around them in the standings. How are you feeling about what we saw this week? Well, uh, the Flames were 16 seconds away from making you correct on our weekly predictions last week. But thankfully... I ended up being correct in the Flames getting four points out of four points and not surrendering any to the opposition. In the end, that's what I wanted, but I just, I didn't see it happening. No, and it was gutsy the game against Anaheim for sure after they gave up the two goal lead. So it's nice to see, and they needed that, and now it's... We're at a point where, okay, good, you did that. Keep going. Yeah, it's nice. They, I mean, you know, they were just in Anaheim, didn't have the showing they wanted, so I was questioning how they would look against Anaheim coming back to the Dome. Now I think the challenge for the team, and we'll talk about the upcoming schedule later, but they've got four road games in a week, and it can sometimes be hard to transition that momentum at home when you go on the road, and then they've got their bye week. So it's not until the 20th that they'll be back here at home. Yeah, and the team just needs to buckle down and get as many points as they can on this road trip so that way they can start to build some momentum towards pushing for a playoff position. And uh, as uh, Gullitson uh, said in his tirade, look at the standings and the Flames are not doing very well and they need to improve. Well, if we take a look at those standings, looking at the Western Conference uh, wildcard standings, we have San Jose in third place in the Pacific at 48 points. Then we have Colorado, Minnesota, Anaheim, and all tied at 47, uh, which puts them in a tie for the last place in the wildcard. And Chicago and Calgary tied at 46 points. After that, it doesn't even matter. Um, but, I mean, this means Calgary is really two points away from San Jose, even though they're out, it's so close right now. As I said before, I can see this one really coming down even to those April games, which it usually doesn't. But I'm really surprised how tight the Western Conference is right now. I know. And, you know, everybody expected the Las Vegas Golden Knights at this point to be number one in the West and second overall. But, uh, yeah, no, the the team is two points out of a divisional spot and they just need to keep getting points and limiting the opposition from getting them and just build on it until they are on more of a firm footing. Like, if the Flames can push themselves into where Los Angeles is or even further up if Vegas falls off the face of the earth, then maybe the team can finish where we were kind of projecting them at the beginning of the season, but they have to start basically today getting wins and just go on a a protracted winning streak, not necessarily like winning 10 in a row, but like say winning seven or eight out of 10. Vegas is a 14 point lead on us. I can't see us getting anywhere near that. It's happened before. Um, the the last year, uh, the before the Flames stopped making the playoffs in the Aginla era, uh, we had like like a fourteen or fifteen point lead on Vancouver and ended up losing it. So, and that was in like, like late February that we had that much of a lead. So it is doable. It's just doesn't happen too often. Another thing, taking a look at the schedule is not only the amount of points, but the number of games played is interesting to me too. So San Jose has 40 games played and they have 48 points. Uh, The teams right around us, Anaheim has 43 and Minnesota has 42 and they're at 47 points. So we've got, you know, a game in hand on those two teams. San Jose has a game in hand on us, but we have, you know, at least one more game to catch up with some of the teams that we're battling for for the f- for final wildcard spot, and that might be some of the works of the Flames' advantage as well. 
Yeah, and, and it it would be nice if the out of town scoreboard was beneficial to the Flames, but they also have to buckle down and get their wor- homework done themselves. I'm hoping that with the Flames skills competition yesterday, uh, January 7th, this team might be going on the road with a little bit more of a fun vibe to them. I think, you know, they've had two good wins. They had the skills comp. I'm hoping that that's going to translate into their first game on the road against Minnesota. Oh, for sure. And especially after the gutsy performance against Anaheim, I'm hoping that uh, there they can build on some of the positive things that the team worked on and the fact that they responded in a very physical manner in that game hopefully them seeing that part of their game drawing success it hopefully they can continue to start laying down a physical game plan against the opponents that they face moving forward and start dictating the play and take it to the other team so that way they can beat them up and win, basically. Well, and we can't talk about this week of games without talking about, as you mentioned earlier, the Glenn Gulletson tirade. If anyone wants to see the video, it's all over the internet, all over social media and the Flames website. But after the LA game, uh, at practice the next day, Coach Gullitson wasn't too happy with his team, and he went as far as threw his stick into the stands. He actually cleared it pretty good. He hit the uh, press or the presence boxes on the lower level, and pretty much told his team, "You know what? No one's working hard enough. We'll use different language than he did, but no one's working hard enough. Look at where we are in the standings. We need to be better." And I thought that the next night against Anaheim, it was really going to be a matter of, okay, if the coach is giving it to the players and they don't respond the media is going to say that, you know what, the the players are the ones that aren't working. So I was glad to see the players responding to that from the coach. Yeah, and a month ago when I had that uh, tirade myself on one of our episodes. Thank you for not throwing a stick. Well, you didn't see what I was doing. You know, we are recording separately, so you never know. I could have thrown a mini hockey stick. But no, uh, <laughs> it, that was the kind of thing I was – hoping to see from the coaching staff because the players all have been just getting in their own way and not taking it seriously and kind of it having like that are say like our expectations of the team being a very successful team well i think that part of it is that the team looked at like the hammock acquisition the smith acquisition and, oh, this team's going to be a top-tier team. And they bought into their own Kool-Aid and without actually putting in the effort in the games to get the results that weren't what the expectations dictated. And having Gullitson flip out on the team is a good thing. And sometimes you just need to basically like shake the person to like wake up you know and the team responded very well in the Anaheim game Uh, that may have been their best performance of the season giving up the lead aside anyway and that's what's necessary and I think to me the big thing here is it's totally uncharacteristic of Gullitson you see this all the time from some coaches like Tortorella Oh yeah, for sure. And where the players get numb to being yelled at, but it's so uncharacteristic for Glenn Gullitson that when it comes, everybody, the media, the fans that were practice, I talked to a couple of them, the players, everybody stops and take notice. And it's like, okay, this guy's serious. Yeah, exactly. And it's one of those situations where he, he needed to show some emotion that he gave, you know, <laughs> I could use some expletives, but <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he cared and, and wants the team to be successful. And sometimes you need to yell at the players to get them to wake up and get on the right track. It- and G- Gullison has said that they've, he's done this before behind closed doors, but I think not only yelling at the players, but doing it in a public forum, like a practice, 
also put some accountability back on the players. I said earlier, we don't know what happens in the dressing room. He could yell and scream as much as he wants to. Nobody knows. But when they get screamed out at a practice like that, then all eyes are on the team of how are they going to respond from this? And I think it is whether he wants to admit it publicly or not. It's a bit of a motivation tactic to say, Hey, you guys have been called out. Now it's up to you to respond and show that you're going to rise to the occasion. Yeah. And that's, Part of like what I was complaining about was his lack of emotion and showing any emotion on the bench. And it's one of those, it's hard to uh, for players to get motivated when you're not seeing the coach being as involved as he needs to be. And we even saw that in the, the Anaheim game. Uh, there was a video clip of Gulletson yelling at the ref after the um, Hathaway incident with the the fight and him getting an instigator and all that. You saw him getting viscerally pissed off at the ref, which was warranted, but it's good to for the players to see that I'm not angry with you as the players, I want to win and showing that passion is what's necessary. It, it's just a good motivational tool a, as a whole to move the team forward. Cause like if you look at the two main coaches that have been successful in recent years, uh, in terms of winning the Stanley cup being, uh, Daryl Sutter and Joel Quenville, they're both calm guys most of the time but if they get angry <laughs> you can see it quite clearly <laughs> and that helps to motivate the players as well because of the fact that the coach has their back yeah you definitely want your coach i mean your coach is you know in in a lot of ways your leader your quarterback for your team and you want to see that he has the same emotion, the same pride, the same passion for the team as the players do. And just like a parent, right? I mean, we've all had times when our parents have yelled and screamed and sometimes it's been a motivation tactic. Sometimes it's just that, hey, don't do that again. You've obviously made me angry. We've all that, you know, parent tells they're disappointed in us. But I think just like you said, showing that emotion shows, okay, this guy is in this and he's just, just as frustrated as everybody else is. And just seeing that, I think... Makes it a little more human for me, I guess. Exactly. And it's just what the team needed. So we'll see how the, how long that motivation lasts, if that's going to continue through the road trip or not. I wouldn't expect to see this from Gullitson again this season. Um, I mean, it's not who he is, and I don't think he's doing it just to make a show. But hopefully, like you said, we'll see a little bit more passion, whether that's on the bench, whether that's talking to the media. I'm hoping maybe this has opened something up deep within him. Yeah, it's one of those things that, in terms of the flame system, like there's nothing really wrong with it, and it it's very similar to the Pittsburgh Penguin system, and like my complaint previously was that the flames just weren't being physical enough. The system itself, there wasn't a huge problem with it. It's just that the team needed to hit more. And that was the my main sticking point. But, like, he's a good coach. It's just sort of like the players getting in their own way. I think he also is getting in his own way because he's a very gentlemanly type of person. Like, y you, you're not going to see him going, you know, half-baked <laughs> yelling at people and just being a jerk like he's not that type of he's person. bruce banner and sometimes we need him to be the hulk exactly and he needs to work in some of that feistiness just in his own person even though it's a departure from who he seems to be as a person well as you've mentioned in the past it's not just him his whole staff has very much the same personality as he does yeah, and that's fine. It's one of those things where, like, intellectually, you, like, draw up your game plan, and, okay, you guys go out and do it. 
and that's how like he the coaching staff seems to all be is just very direct like here's what we're gonna do go do it and great but there's the other side of the coin where you also need to have the psychology and all of that kind of stuff and motivational thing he's very much an x's nose coach he's a hockey coach and sons that head coach also needs to be sort of the human resources guy the guy who knows how to motivate and get the most out of his employees and maybe that's where Gullitson lacks a little bit. Yeah, and that that's exactly why I was saying like a guy like Daryl Sutter uh, because of the fact that like Rhett Warner had mentioned that he knew when specifically to push people's buttons and when not to. And he was very good at that. And if Gullitson can learn how to do the motivation side of things, like it, it's... How would you say it, it? It it's hard when you know you're devising a system and you it if you're basically treating it like a hockey simulation like NHL 2017 or something, and you do things set up this way, then you expect X results. Well, it you're dealing with people too, and the biggest variable here is human beings. Yeah, and that's where I think part of the the main part of the problem was was not getting enough from the that side of the coin and now it seems thus far that that part has developed and hopefully that continues and we see just some more passion from the bench and everything start to coalesce together because this team is legitimately a good team when they're on the same page it's just getting them there (laughs) well let's move on a bit from the coach and let's talk about some of the transactions two major transactions this week that we saw one more surprise than the other um the calgary flames for the second time this season put freddie hamilton on waivers Weren't sure what was happening there. I thought maybe he was going to go down to Stockton just because he hadn't played here much, send him down and get him some ice time, especially with all the Stockton players that Calgary brought up. I thought, okay, clear some space for him. And the next morning we find out he was claimed by the Arizona Coyotes, something I don't think any of us expected to happen. Good for Freddie. He's probably going to a team where he's going to get more time. But Matt, and I mentioned this to you before the show a little bit, we know the history there with Trill Living and Arizona, and we know that there's been a lot of transactions between those two teams. How much of this do you think was a, hey, can you guys help me out here? I mean, we know that Trill Living probably still has some good ties to that organization with some of the deals we've seen. How much do you think is, hey, can you guys just help me out here and claim Freddie for me? I think it's partially that. I, Arizona's been going through some injury difficulties as well, and they wanted to basically just have somebody to be the Freddie Hamilton of the Flames, that extra guy who can slot in effectively. And I think it is partially that. And I think that uh, the team needed to move on from having Freddie on the team full time. It's just one of those situations where Calgary has too many good players in the organization where he's more like the 18th or 19th or 20th best forward in the organization and at that point why are you having him in the NHL and well I think this move was totally made because their hand was forced by young guys like Manja Penny and Hathaway who you have to find room for and at some point It just makes sense that Freddie's the guy to go. So good for those young players for pushing them to make that move. Yeah, and I don't think anybody expected Mangiapane to make the NHL this season. Uh, Not realistically, anyway. And he's fitting in like he's been here all along. And that's great. Awesome. It's just unexpected. And when you have unexpected good things happen you have to move somebody out and unfortunately it was Freddie and you know he will get more ice time with Arizona 
And, and it's not like Hamilton's a bad player. It's just Calgary is unusually deep at every position where, like, the Flames have had a, a couple of injuries and other situations, and the replacement guys come in and have done an amazing job. Well, that's great. Like, we haven't really missed anybody since various players have gone down or injured or whatever so it's just one of those situations where calgary is reaping the benefits of a good farm system and hopefully they can slot a few more people in if necessary if additional injuries happen and that those players are equally successful and you're gonna see more of this you know as i think we continue through the salary cap era where you the teams really want the young guys to make the team. They want them to push for the team because they're cheaper and they can keep them around longer. So I wouldn't be surprised if this was almost part of the plan right from the beginning is bring Freddie in, put him there, and tell everyone in Stockton, this is your job to take. And that's exactly what's happened. So as you mentioned, Freddie, I'm excited for him. He's going to get some time in Arizona, hopefully, uh, get some more play time there. It sucks for Dougie. He's lost his brother. I know you hate it when I – say this, but for once, Freddie is officially Doug Les, and he'll be moving on, and I think it could be good for everybody. I think it's, you know, going to give Dougie maybe a, a different look at his day. I know he was living with his brother, so having a new roommate, having maybe more social time with the guys could be good for everybody. Yeah, we'll see. Um, of course, he was we'll bummed at first, but it's a, you know, it's a business. Yeah, and it's, you know, it was nice that he was here, and it was good that Freddie was able to be in the organization for as long as he was. And, you know, it's not like he's going to disappear off the face of the earth, you know. It, and at the same the time, season. yeah, and at the same time, I'm not worried about, oh, Freddie Hamilton's going to go somewhere else and, you know, be a pain to play against. Like, he's not one of those players either. No, it's just a, like a quadruple a player for baseball fans somebody who's too good for the upper farm league but not really a major league player and he's one of those tweener guys who i'm sure he'll bounce around a few more times before his career's done but he he'll play and that's good and uh, we'll see it I'm expecting like the next time that the Flames play the Coyotes that he'll be in the lineup. And, you know, I always like to look at these kind of things too as sort of seeing what you gave up versus what you got for a player. We brought Freddie Hamilton in on a conditional seventh round pick was the trade. We didn't end up giving him the condition. So we paid nothing to give him up and we paid nothing to lose him. So in the end, we're net positive on this one. Yep. However, yeah, I remember that uh, period where like we gave uh, Max Reinhardt to Nashville, I think it was, for a conditional thing, and we got Hamilton, and neither condition was actually merited. Uh, I think we were going to get a conditional fourth for Reinhardt, but that never materialized either. So, yeah, just one of those weird situations. Yeah, I think Freddie Hamilton, if I remember correctly, was a conditional seventh from the Avalanche. Yeah. I don't know what the condition was, but... Um, yeah, what's with those Reinhardt players? Jeez. You know, you got three decent prospects, and all three have disappointed significantly. It's just like the Strom brothers. Who knows? It's just gotta, weird. You got to wonder if uh, the Coyotes realize that or what? There's two Hamiltons thing and they were getting the other one on waivers. Yeah. Well, they don't have uh, Benning as their GM, so I don't think that that would be the case. <laughs> That's true. Though I, I don't know about this new guy. He's all about, you know, the stats. He's trying to play money ball with hockey. So that's why I'm not a fan. It, the. Advanced stats, they're good to a point, but they don't give you the entire picture. And if you've looked at the two teams that bought in whole hog on the advanced stats, you had the Florida Panthers and the Arizona Coyotes. 
Well, uh, Arizona's dead last in the Western Conference, and uh, where's Florida? I think they're right near the bottom, too. Yeah, they're not doing too well right now. Yeah, they're uh, at, at 40 points, so just above <laughs> but the worst team in the West, or East, so... Yeah, they're not doing too good either. So it, it's one of those things that it, if you're putting too much stock into something that doesn't isn't fully fleshed out as an idea, that it, you tend to create more problems than not. And, well, as we've seen Arizona, they have 10 wins on the season. Not so good. Just to finish up our thoughts on transactions here, the Flames did make one other transaction after Freddie Hamilton got waived, bringing up Merrick Rivick from Stockton. Uh, for those that don't remember, Merrick Rivick was signed by the Flames, I believe, pretty early in July this past summer, but he was brought in as a free agent uh, from the New York Rangers organization. He's 26 years old. Uh, he's six foot two and weighs 197 pounds. Played most of his career in the AHL, has a couple games in the NHL, but this is another guy who I think you're not going to see probably as a... He, I think he projects to be very much like a Freddie Hamilton. He's a good 13th, 14th forward. If he's in your top 12, top you know four lines, you're probably a little bit shallow on those lines, but a guy that I think could have some staying power with the Flames. Yeah, and he looked fairly well uh, as a player in preseason before he got injured he may have even made the team out of camp if it wasn't for the injury so uh, he was more than a point per game in Stockton and when you have four players that have been playing at that caliber in Stockton uh, Jankowski, Hathaway, Manjapani, and Rivik and the other three are doing so well why not try number four the other thing about Horrific is he's 26, and at that age, you kind of have to decide. I think he's only on a one-year contract, too. You have to kind of decide if he's NHL-worthy or not. You don't want to leave guys 27, 28, 29 in the AHL, so I think this is the Flames' chance to bring him up, see if he can do what needs to be done at the NHL level, and if not, they just probably won't renew that contact, contract in the offseason. Yeah, I think what you're going to see is Matt Stajan will get benched for a game at some point. And Revic will be given an opportunity and say, well, there's Stajan's job. Go be better than him and you get it. And I think that's what you'll end up seeing. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if Revic stays up here for the rest of the season just because he is that older um, sort of fill-in guy. I think he kind of takes Freddie Hamilton's place. Yeah, he can play in multiple positions too if necessary. So he can just be that versatile if in case of injury, break glass type thing. And with Freddie gone now, I could almost see Merrick getting that role next year as well, getting re-signed and being that 13th forward for the Flames next season. Yep. If he's cheap and he's decent, hey, awesome. He's making 650000 right now. I can't see him getting that much of a raise in the offseason, and I'd rather have a 26-year-old guy playing that 13th forward role than a Mangiapane or a Hathaway. Those are guys either have to be in the lineup all the time or in the AHL. Exactly. Well, Matt, the big story of the week, probably the one that is getting the most talk among the Sea of Red this week, is it was reported on Hockey Night in Canada that the Calgary Flames and Yarmer Yager are looking for an exit strategy. And I think we can all agree that as much as it's been fun to have Yager and all the fanfare that came with signing number 68, things haven't really turned out the way the Flames wanted them to. He's older. Um, it's almost like his head is saying he wants to play hockey and his body's saying, no, we're done. He's been injured for a lot of the season. He's had various lower body injuries, I guess a groin and a knee. He's not on the trip to Minnesota with the Flames. And he wants to play. And the Flames obviously need to move on from him if he can't play. So, not surprised to hear this. I was kind of hoping we'd get a season out of him, but it's not surprising. What are your thoughts on hearing that the Flames and Yager are looking for a way to get out of this relationship? It's always disappointing, especially with so much admiration for number 68, that it just sucks. You don't like seeing some 
player that you just genuinely like as a person have to retire just because of age? It just, and I mean, it's, it's not like management's held him down. We've given him all the chances we can. And I think coming into this, too, we knew this was going to be a bit of an experiment. Oh, yeah. And uh, it, if he didn't get hurt and was playing without the injuries, I think he would have been basically what the Panthers got out of him last year. A decent, like, 40-point-ish secondary score and it just didn't turn out it, that groin injury just kept getting re-aggravated and re-aggravated and re-aggravated and I mean, it just gotta, sucks he, we gotta remember how old he is too most guys quit the NHL about 35 he's 45 so these kind of injuries I think coming into this it was expected I think that if he got hurt it was probably going to be the end of the season yeah, and it's just one of those lingering, continually lingering problems, and unfortunately, it's just tough to see him go, and it was just a awesome experience to have Yarmir Yager play for the Calgary Flames, and you know, I don't think too many fans are going to be happy to see him go. I think a lot of fans just genuinely were happy that he was here and i just hope that he enjoyed his time in calgary and got to go to the mountains and enjoy himself there as well and you know well it is and, what and it the is. players too i mean you still talk to the players i've talked to some of them as i've been in the dressing room doing media stuff and they love to talk about just getting that chance to play with Yarmer. And I think for a lot of these guys, like Goudreau, like Bennett, who've Goudreau assisted on his first goal of the year, Yarmer set Bennett up for one of his goals this year. You know, they're just going to have that memory forever. And I think that's a great thing the Flames were able to give them that and to at least bring Yarmer in and try it. My question to you, Matt, is what do you think happens? Do you think the Flames just put him on the IR and he rides off into the sunset? Do you think the Flames do some sort of a retirement ceremony? What do you think is going to be the end result of this, I guess, divorce between Yarmir Yager and the Flames? Honestly, I think the main, the first thing will be uh, the, Peter Svoboda, his uh, agent, will probably be talking with each team around the NHL to see Apparently if anybody wants happened. them. And if that doesn't happen, then I think they'll just try to mutually terminate the contract, and that'll be that. Yeah, I mean, it's <clears throat> if you terminate the contract, unless he's going to play for his team in Europe, it would have to be a buyout. Otherwise, it's a defection. And I don't know if the Flames want to buy him out. I think he'd probably just sign himself to the team he owns in Europe just to get out of the contract, even if he doesn't play there. Yeah. I can I can also see the Flames trying to strike some sort of a deal where it's like the Freddie Hamilton deal. You give them to the Penguins for a conditional seventh, the condition being that Yager has to play every other game this season, knowing we'll never meet it, or even just future considerations. I think that might be the way to go, is trade Yager back to Pittsburgh and let him retire as a Penguin. As much as I think Flames fans would love to see him retire here, he's really done nothing as a Flame. Like, if he's going to retire, he should retire with a team that he had some significant impact with. I agree. And it wouldn't take that much. I mean, he's, you know, yeah, his agent's going to shop him around. I don't see anybody wanting him. He's an old, broken-down 45-year-old. No one's going to give us anything for him. Um, you don't want to waive him. Like, you got to have some dignity there. I think the best thing to do might be just trade him to Pittsburgh and move on. What? You don't remember Los Angeles Kings legend Jerome Ginla or Chicago Blackhawks legend Theo Fleury? You know, it, that just doesn't seem right. So, yeah, naturally he should get the opportunity to go back to Pittsburgh for to retire, whether it's at the end of the season, like a one-day contract or whatever. I you think know, that I, would be better. You I know, think if they just, trade him to Pittsburgh at the deadline or even before, I'm sure he can muster up the strength to play one 
more regular season game. Yeah. I think that would be possible. You know, I mean, they've got to have a game coming up against Edmonton or Arizona where you put them in, you let them play five minutes. And, you know, you go out that way. To your point with uh, Theo Fleury and Iggy, remember that Fleury actually did come back here when he retired. He got a shot at training camp. And Iggy's not actually retired yet. That story hasn't been written quite yet. True. So we... But, yeah, I think it's... I don't know. It's sad to see Jeremy Yager go. I think he's had a positive influence. There's been a lot of talk of him potentially staying on with the team, maybe having a Conroy-like role where he works in the office. I don't think Yager wants to stay here. I think for him, North America, from from talking to him and talking to people around him, he looks at North America as work. He's only in North America because he wants to play in the National Hockey League. If he doesn't have a playing job, he's just going to go back home to the Czech Republic. I've also heard some people say maybe he'll play for the Czech uh, Olympic team. Looking at the health issues he has, I don't think that's going to happen either. Yeah, I doubt it. I mean, maybe they bring him on as some sort of a, you know, figurehead coach or something on that team if he gets released before the Olympics. But I really think, honestly, the days of him playing competitive hockey are probably over. I agree. I mean, if he wants to sign himself to his own team in the Czech Republic, it would be like, you know, Lemieux letting himself go for the Penguins again. That's his prerogative to do so. But I don't think you see him play at any high level. And it's been fun having him here. But I think uh, the tra- traveling Yagers are going to have to retire their mullets because Yarmer, I think, is going to be gone by, I'd say, by the All-Star break. Can't argue with you there. My guess, honestly, is that if they don't trade him to Pittsburgh, they just put him on the IR and let him go home. I think they'll just put him on the long-term injury reserve and you know pay him out and just let him go home and do his thing. Yep. So I'm... I just don't see any NHL team wanting him. His agent can shop him around as much as he wants to. I'd be shocked if the Flames get anything for him. I don't think it's worth paying the buyout cap next or the buyout penalty next year to buy him out. I just put him on IR and go that way. Would you disagree, Matt? No, not at all. So if you don't have one yet and you want your souvenir, buy your number 68 jersey fairly soon because after yager has gone, they're going to get harder to find. It's weird how that went from probably being the hottest Christmas present in Alberta to I wouldn't be surprised if you can get them on the discount rack at Fanatic come April. Well, Matt, we're halfway through the season at this point. We talked about that at the beginning. And Flames played 41 of their 82 games. And I, I was talking to a friend of mine, and he said, you know what, the Flames are in a good spot because they've got the easier portion of the schedule coming up. So I had to take a look at the schedule and really analyze it for what he was saying. He said, if you look at the teams that the Flames are playing, they have a lot more games against Eastern Conference teams where they're not going to be giving up as many points to the West. They've got no big road trips coming, and most of the teams they still have are easy teams. He was saying teams that they've beaten, a lot of Edmonton games, Arizona games. Just curious to get your thoughts on what you think of that statement that the second half of the schedule is going to be the easier one. The quality of the opponent's might be slightly less challenging, but they're also playing pretty much like every other day from the end of January forward. But that's what they usually do as NHL players. Yeah, it's just... uh, I don't know. I I don't like to say, oh, well, uh, we're going to be playing teams like florida and carolina so therefore we're gonna win no uh, every team is capable of beating any other team on any given night and yeah it in terms of the averages probably it is going to be a slightly easier second half but the flames need to just go out and get the two points on any given night and not be oh well it's, say, the New York Islanders. We don't need to worry about them. Uh, they need to go and just beat the other team. And it doesn't matter who they're facing on any given night. They can't take anybody lightly. For sure. I'd agree with that part of it, for sure. I think we're seeing teams now that are surging like Colorado that we weren't expecting to. So you never know by the time you get to that game if that team's hot or not. And with the West being so close right now, 
anybody on any given night could be your spoiler. The thing that I am looking at, though, I'm just, as you're talking, going through the Flames schedule here, I am seeing that I think this schedule is going to be a little easier in terms of travel. If you look at the travel they've got, they've got a lot more, probably a lot more than usual. Trips where they're on the road for a couple days, but they're playing, you know, teams right next to each other. Like often they'll do a New York swing and somewhere in there they'll end up going somewhere weird. But if you look in February, they got, you know, the Devils, the Rangers and the Islanders, Boston and Nashville on a two week schedule. And it's like, okay, that's a very doable trip. There's not a lot of change of time zone. They're all relatively close together. So I think just the the scheduling of these games, having a few days apart on a lot of them, and having fairly short trips could be what makes a difference for this team. Yeah, like even later at on in February, you got Vegas and Arizona as a back to back. Well, those are two fairly close proximity cities and then and you you've have got dallas a day on either colorado. side which makes it nice yeah and you have dallas and colorado right at the end of the month and those two are also relatively close to each other so and then in march you've got pittsburgh buffalo ottawa with a day between each one like they're just they're relatively easy trips to do yeah and i think that could be what helps the flames with their stamina i think if they're going to go further in the standings than they are they're definitely going to need to outlast some of their opponents and yeah. i think that just looking and, at these trips that's what yeah could like help even in mark the end of march you got another vegas arizona trip and another san jose la trip they're not it's not like they're going from say minnesota to vancouver or something like that like they're all close together so it it makes things a lot easier yeah we've talked about it but it seems like the scheduling for the nhl was done differently this year and i actually quite like the schedule this year yeah so do i there's always some times when you look at it and go, what the heck is happening here? Like some arena must have had, you know, something going on where you couldn't be there. And like you said, they'll go from Dallas to Vancouver to Edmonton back to Nashville. And it's like, what the heck? But especially the second half, it's a very doable schedule. Yeah. And uh, they play Vegas four times in the last couple months of the season. So could be good or bad for us. The we'll expansion see. Team. So. Yeah, that's I either mean, a good thing or a bad thing. It's a good thing if you know that okay, they have sixty points and they're the top team, so we can't take them lightly. <laughs> yeah, I think when when we were pegging games at the beginning of the season, those were all games that I'd penciled as probably surefire wins. And now you got to be scratching your head, going, "Huh, maybe we, there's something else to this Vegas team that we should be worried about when we get there." Yeah, well, it's also hard to have a proper scouting report on a team when they've never played together. So I think that's part of the problem with the team early in the season is that just teams have never played them. Well, so that's an interesting l- point too. We we're not playing them till the second half, all of our games. So we might have a little bit more, more ability to scout that team because we've already seen what they can and can't do. Yeah. Didn't Vegas play it the whole first month at home? Pretty much. Yeah. So they're due a lot more road games coming up then. Yep. The other thing looking at this schedule is there's not that many back-to-backs, which I think will help this team too, especially if we plan to ride Mike Smith. We've got Tampa Bay, Florida on the road back-to-back uh, this month. It's pretty much one or two back-to-backs every month. Next month in February, we have New Jersey and the Rangers, and then later in the month, Vegas and Arizona, and later in the month, Dallas and Colorado. Those are all pretty doable back-to-backs with enough rest around them, but there's not a whole lot of back-to-backs left in the schedule. Really, February's got some, and that's it. Um, So I think that's going to help too, especially if this team wants to keep riding Smith. Yeah, and the one beneficial thing is that Riddick has played so well in his games that uh, the Flames can get away with utilizing him more like i'm i'm fully expecting that he riddick will play against florida uh this week and probably will get one uh, the buffalo game and possibly the edmonton game next week depending on how this team looks in the florida game i wouldn't be opposed to putting riddick in in carolina um just shut down shut smith down a little bit early because then they have the bye week going on there and I think that those couple extra days could help him get a little bit more rest in, which he needs right now. Yeah. We'll see. But, yeah, it's going to really depend how they do in Minnesota, Tampa Bay, for them to make that decision. But um, also, for those that don't know on the schedule, the Flames do not play from the 15th to the 19th. That's their bye week. Remember, that was introduced last year. 
So there will be, I don't even think they're allowed to practice during that time. It's pretty much a week off for the entire team. Yep. So it's not like anyone's going to stay in Carolina. There's none to do there. But you'll probably see guys take off from Carolina to go to Hawaii or somewhere else. And then they come back home. And I don't know. It always seems to me like it'd be nice to finish your bye week at home. And the Flames have a three-game homestand after that. Yeah. So I don't know if I'd say, like Matt said, the quality of opponents is going to be easier. But I think the scheduling is well done this year. And there's enough breaks where they need breaks as well that I think this could be a, an easier segment for the Flames. Yeah, they play every other some months, but then if you look, it always seems like right when they probably need it, there's a two- or three-day break, and I think that might be what saves this team a little bit. Well, Matt, why don't we answer some questions from Twitter? We've been asking people every week if they have anything they want us to talk about, and we got three people who responded to us this week. Kevin Olenek, a friend of the show, we've been on his podcast a few times, asked us trade rumors. Have we heard any trade rumors uh, for the Calgary Flames? You and I have talked about a few in the past with Bennett potentially being maybe shipped off to Buffalo, that sort of thing. Kevin mentioned he'd heard a Pacioretty rumor coming to Calgary. I don't know about you. I can't see what the Flames would want to give up for Pacioretty. I'm not saying he's not a good player, but I think Pacioretty's going to get a King's ransom, and I don't really want to pay that right now. Yeah, and I don't like Pacioretty whatsoever as a player. I think he's a very passive and lazy player, and I don't think that someone that you need in the organization he's good but i've never been a fan of his and i just i think somebody's gonna overpay for packer eddie and regret that they did yeah and uh, he seems like the type of player that like when the wheels come off like he just vanishes and i think that uh, that part of his career is coming sooner than later and I would not want to pay hit whatever it is that the Flames would need to to get him. And I I just think there are better options, a lot of better options out there. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is I think that Montreal overvalues him. Oh, of course they do. Um, and, and that's going to be why it's going to cost so much more to try and get him. Yeah, and it's not like the Flames have any French players that they can make a trade for. Yeah, so it's... Maybe we can start pronouncing Brower in a French manner. <laughs> and try to trick them? Yeah, yeah, because like that it's... Sergachev for Drew Ann trade was just uh, so stupid. And Well, what about Matt Stajan? Yeah, that works. Maybe they could take him off our hands or Matt Bartkowski. Yeah. Or so, Stone. I don't know. <laughs> there you go. Put an accent on the E. Yeah. Somebody can sew it right on the jersey. Yep. <laughs> um, I mean, it does bring us to our poll from last week where we asked fans, who would you think would be the first Calgary Flame to be traded this season? We already saw the Eddie Lack trade, but at the time he was in Stockton. So most people thought Troy Brower would be the first person traded. I still believe, as you and I have talked about, that Brower is going to be tough for this team to move. And then we had a three-way tie for TJ Brody, Sam Bennett, and a write-in vote of Michael Stone as the second-place option on the poll. Um, there has been some talk of the Flames potentially sending a defenseman maybe to Ottawa for a guy like uh, Hoffman or bringing in, now that we don't have the Hamilton brothers, bringing the Stone brothers together. What are your thoughts on those rumors? Well, I think if you look at how Stockton has played, the, and the players that have come up from Stockton have played in the NHL. The Flames could move a defenseman, and I don't think that it would be the end of the world to have either Anderson or Shillington take their place. And, yeah, it's going to be a step down, but you're not... It's not like going from a, you know, uh, Matthew Kachuk to... Uh, Hunter and Carrick, you know, it, and maybe not this season, but I think at some point the Flames will be forced to make a move just to bring a defenseman up. Yeah, you have to look the Flames because of the fact that they have Valamaki and the two guys in Stockton. They also have uh, Adam Fox, who is, although he is a Flames prospect, he needs to, he can 
wait out the four years and sign with anybody else too. And if the Flames aren't showing the willingness to graduate players up, he doesn't really have any incentive to sign here either. And like, uh, yeah, it's not the loyal thing to do, but we saw Vessi go from Nashville to the New York Rangers for that reason. And yeah, I mean, the flames have shown their willingness to do that on the forward side where they have room, but I think right now we're so gridlocked on the blue line and you know, it's a good blue line, but yeah, they haven't, they just haven't done it. Cause I don't think they can right now. Yeah. And I think that with the ability of both Shillington and Anderson in Stockton, that I think that if they moved one of Giordano, Hamilton, or Brody in a deal, that it wouldn't be as drastic of a step down from the entire defense core than it would be under a normal circumstance. And I think that... I think a big part of that, too, is the emergence of Kulak. Yeah, and I think that with... Like, you have to give to get, and... Uh, other teams need defense. We just happen to have them coming all over the place. Like we have so many defensemen that are good that we need right wingers. So parlay one of them into that. And like you look at Nashville, they had the same problem. They had so many good defensemen and they they had no forwards and they parlayed Seth Jones into Ryan Johansson and that helped them go to the Stanley Cup final and Johansson's a legitimate top line forward and Seth Jones is of a similar caliber as the three top three defensemen on the Flames so the Flames could get a top line like another Monaghan or Jordan or Gaudreau pardon me uh level player for one of those three defensemen if they decide to do so. And I think that on the whole, like, yeah, the defense will take a hit, but we can absorb the hit. And I think that on the whole, it will make the team better if they go that route. It's just finding some the right dance partner. So addressing the rumor that's out there, do you think that bringing in another number 68, Mike Hoffman from the Senators, would be the right move? Possibly. It would depend on what the deal is. and If it, it was one for one, let's say it was uh, Brody for Hoffman. Not getting enough. And th- that's where, like, it, it depends on, like, secondary adders and all that stuff as well. Like, if like the flames were to toss a little secondary piece in and get Jean Gabriel Peugeot in that deal, then okay, fine. That's doable. But it just depends. And that's like, that's why it's so hard to come up with a, a legitimate trade rumor idea, like a trade possibility because getting the valuations to actually match up, properly it's just so difficult and i think knowing for living he's very conservative in his moves i can see him for better for worse holding on to his defensive core if he thinks we're in a playoff spot if we're not however i think it'll be really interesting to see because i wouldn't be surprised at all if we're out of this if the flames make a big sale at the deadline oh i don't think the flames will go whole on sale i just think that I don't think they'll go whole on sale, but I can see them making a big splash by selling one big defenseman. Yeah, and I think that they really should do that either way. Um, I don't disagree, but just knowing Tre Living, I don't think he's going to do it. No, and it's one of those situations where does it make sense? And he if would you'd... probably rather do that at the draft floor. Yeah, and if the deal makes sense, you and it makes sense now, it'll make sense le- later, but it won't make much of a difference if you pull the trigger now versus later. So if a proper deal comes about and it works, then go ahead. It just Especially with the West being so tight this year, I can't see there being a lot of deals to be made with other Western teams. No, and it just largely depends on who you're dealing with and what you're getting. And 
there are a lot of teams out there that you can make deals with. It just, it really depends on all of the secondary details, really. And it's not easy. And we'll see. And you got to look at the fact that because the Flames have such a high caliber defense core, the fact that you look at other trades in the past of similar caliber players that the Flames would be looking to move, like you're not getting just um, like a Michael Backlund caliber player. You're getting a top tier first line, legitimate first line talent. Out of it. I think the advantage there is if someone's looking for a defenseman this year, they're probably calling the Flames first just because of what our defensive core looks like. Yeah, and it like I could see the Flames making a deal with Toronto because they have a glut of forwards and they need defense. There's a handful of teams out there that you could see a realistic deal. Like a, yeah, I like think a it'll Brody end up being a deal with the East. Yeah, like a Brody for Marner deal that makes sense for both sides. And you'd have to add, like, little secondary parts to make it work. But you know what I mean. Like, it, it with all of them, there are ways of getting it to work. Like, say, Nylander instead of Marner. There's different ways of going about it. But There's lots of trades we can make. But on the rumors that we've heard, we don't think any of them are making sense right now. No, not as they sit. So let's move on to the next question that we got on Twitter, just because we have a couple more questions to get through. Um, you know, we could sit here and talk potential deals and potential add this or add that all day, and I don't think we probably want to do that because, as Matt said, it, there's so many deals that could be made, and if they, if it makes sense, hopefully they'll do it. So I think as we get near the trade deadline and see who's in and who's out, that might be a better time to do some of that. Yep. Um, John Wallace Howell at John Howell 77 on Twitter asked us, will we make the playoffs and what do we need to focus on for the second half of the season? Matt, why don't we get your take on this first? I think the flames will make the playoffs. Uh, I think that the season would be a catastrophic failure if they didn't make the playoffs. Um, so I'm not even entertaining that as a possibility until they are eliminated. Uh, so where do you think their focus needs to be for the next 41 games? Uh, the focus needs to be on doing all the little things and uh, just details. Uh, the team has enough talent where if they're focusing on the details and not making little dumb mistakes here, there, and everywhere, like what we were discussing last week of death by a thousand small cuts, they'll be fine. It's just making sure that they're on the right page consistently. And I think that the Flames, if they can parlay the games that they had this week into like a, a momentum builder, the Flames could go on a tear. And it just, it'll, we'll see. And I'm hopeful that they'll start moving up the standings. I still think that they, they could get a home ice advantage spot in the playoffs and they just have to be consistent and win that word you said i think is what i'm going to go with for the second half i think for me in order for the flames to make the playoffs which i think they're going to looking at the schedule and the other teams around us and their schedules i think the flames will make the playoffs i think their key is consistency we see them come out and play great games. Then we see head scratchers. Where it's like, how did they let this one go? And what happened here? I think if the Flames can play consistency consistently, even at, say, 80% of what they're capable of, I think that's going to be enough to get them into the playoffs and get them through one round of the playoffs. But they have to play like the team they are on paper every night. We can't have these you know, blowouts or these leads that we're blowing, as long as this team is playing consistently the way we know they can, they're going to be fine. Yeah, because bad bounces will happen, and you will give up bad goals every once in a while. But they need to have the response they did against Anaheim, where, okay, yeah, they gave up a bad shorthanded goal. Uh, it was just a bad play. And then Getzlaff had a seeing-eye shot. Okay, he gave up the lead. And what did 
Calgary do? They took it to Anaheim the rest of the game and finally broke through with 16 seconds left. That's the the resiliency that they need to have, and we just need to see more of that. Yeah, that consistency is what's going to take us to the playoffs this season. The last question we got from Ryan Swanson, at 76 Swanson on uh, Twitter, asked us, would this team be better with different assistant coaches? Matt, we already know your thoughts on the head coach. Assuming that the Flames, for better or for worse, are going to keep Gullitson here, do you think that we would see much marked difference if, say, the rest of his staff were to be replaced with different assistant coaches? No. I don't see that. There wouldn't be... You're just shuffling deck chairs, basically, at that point. Like, when I was saying to fire the coach, it was because things were not, in my opinion, being done enough in the right manner to get the most out of the team. And we've seen some changes since that show in how the team is being deployed overall lineup changes and deployment changes and even with his outburst this week attitude changes from the coaching staff so if they keep going the way they are and the making those changes permanent and getting more out of the players that the players have in them then there's no need to change the coach anyway. It's just what my frustration was, was the disconnect between the talent on the team and the results on the ice. And the Flames since that have played significantly better and they're starting to look more like the team on paper. That just has to continue. That's all. I've heard a lot of criticism from fans saying, oh, you know, we've got Paul Gerard and we've got Dave Cameron and Cameron's running, I think, the power play and it's terrible. And you got to remember, it's not like he's doing it at arm's length from the coach. It's not like Gullitson can't step in there and say, Dave, this isn't working. Like Gullitson still has that that authority over this team. And I think whether it was Dave Cameron or somebody else, we would have had the same result. Do you remember years ago, Matt, when we had a terrible power play and everyone said, oh, it's Rich Preston, it's Rich Preston. Then Rich Preston got let go, and the power play was still terrible. Yeah. yeah. It, Calgary... The coach can only do so much for that. Yeah, like, Calgary has modified how they deploy the power play entirely. It's not the same. The Brower play? Not only not having him on the Brower play, but just how they set up on the power play. They're passing a lot more than they used to and are moving more and they're still not scoring so like they're trying to get it to work it's just they're not getting bounces to go their way and the power play largely there are only so many ways that you can deploy a power play unit and Usually the power plays that are most successful are ones where the players are moving with the puck because it causes the defenders to move. And when the defenders move, lanes get opened, pass, pass, goal. And the Flames are doing that now and they're just not getting the end product. And that could just be bad luck. It could be that they're just not quite comfortable yet with doing it that way. We'll see. And uh, If there's one piece of this coaching staff, I think, I don't want to say is expendable, but if you're going to change one piece, I think it could be Marty Jelena. Yeah. I, it, I, it's one of those things that, eh, you could, but why? What <laughs> The only reason I mention is I would like to see an experienced coach here in that associate coach role. I think Gullitson is still a very new head coach in terms of NHL head coaches, and I wouldn't be opposed to bringing in somebody with some more experience, somebody like a Daryl Sutter, not necessarily Daryl Sutter, but somebody to sort of be that associate coach with a little bit more experience, maybe somebody who can handle the, as we talked about earlier, the human being side of the game 
a little bit differently. So yeah. I don't think I'd necessarily get rid of the coaches, but I think maybe bringing on some more experience could be a good thing. And if you have to, I'd be willing to sacrifice Jelena to get that. Well, I think the problem with that is you're basically causing uh, the same situation when the Flames hired Feaster when Sutter was the GM. And then Burke when Feaster was the GM. You're you're saying that you're kind of setting them up, saying this is the this is the heir apparent. Yeah, you're getting replaced by this guy. It's just it, we're going to just ride you until we're tired of your being here, and that's not fair to Gulletson. That's not really fair to the coaching staff either. So it's. Just... I think it depends how you do it. If you get a guy who's actively in the coaching hunt or actively looking for a job, for sure. I'm not necessarily saying this is the right guy, but if you were to get a guy like a Dave King or a Pierre Paget who have done enough coaching, they're not looking for a job anymore, but they're brought in more as that advisor type role, and you know this guy's not going to replace me, I think that's the kind of guy that works. You don't bring in a Lindy Ruff or a Daryl Sutter, a guy who's looking for a job right now. Yeah, Sort of like the Brian Burke as our, you know, as our president of hockey ops, you kind of get the sense Burke is done his, with his GM career, but he still has a lot to offer the organization. You know, I don't think Burke is gunning for the GM spot. I don't think he's going to leave us for another GM spot. I don't think if True Living gets fired, he wants that spot. I don't know who that coach is, but I think you could find somebody either, you know, around here or further away but just somebody with a little more experience who can because if you look at the assistant coaches they're all well-known assistant coaches and well-known head coaches at the AHL level but we don't really have that guy who I think Gullitson can lean on when the going gets tough who can tell him here's how I've done it in the past and it's more that advisor role I guess which I would put in as the associate coach yeah it, it to me it's like <laughs> It's not necessary right now. And I just think you don't go out looking for it. That that would be an off season thing at best. Yeah, for sure. But I'm saying if we're going to make a change to the coaching staff, um, I think that's the change you make because you try to bring in a little bit more experience to that coaching staff. You also need a coach who's comfortable with his assistants. And I think if we change out the assistants, these guys were handpicked by Gullitson. I mean, we've seen weird stuff in the past where the Flames kept all the assistants and changed the head coach. That happened with the Sutters, I think. And it's like, well, what's going on here? So Gullitson has a staff. And I think if you believe in the head coach, you have to believe in his staff as well. But I don't think having more smart hockey guys on the bench or in the coach's room could be a, a detriment. No. We'll see. I I don't think it's an urgently needed thing. No, and and I don't think you're necessarily looking for it, but you know, we've got a lot of hockey guys who find that, oh, okay, here's one I could see happening just because of the relationships they have. If Dave Tippett decides that he's done, I could see Trill Living trying to bring a guy like that in. And that's possible. You know, I don't think necessarily anyone's going to say, oh, Tippett's going to be the next head coach. But you bring him in more as that experienced guy. And that's, uh, like you said, you're not going out and actively seeking it, but that's the only thing I could see them changing to the coaching staff is adding instead of subtracting. So, Matt, with that, we've gone through a lot of Flames news this week, some interesting stories. Let's look at the week ahead for the Flames. The week ahead has the Flames on the road for four games. On January 9th, they're in Minnesota. That's a 6 p.m. Mountain Time start time. Then they have a day break on Wednesday, and they play a back-to-back against Tampa Bay and Florida. Tampa Bay on the 11th, a 5.30 Mountain Start Time, and Florida on the 12th, a 5.30 Mountain Start Time again. Then they get a day's break, and they take on the Carolina Hurricanes, a 1 p.m. start time on the 14th. And then they go on their one-week sabbatical, if you will, or their bye week. So four games on the table, all on the road. Looking at these, really only one game that we can't give up points in, and that's the Minnesota game. What are you thinking for this week? Realistically, they need six points. So there's eight on the table. Which one do you think they'd drop? They need six. Ideally, they'd get eight. But, you know, saying, oh, well, we're just going to go on a seven-game winning streak, that's not really realistic. Um 
I think if you're going to drop one, the most likely will be the Tampa game, just because they're the best team in the NHL. Um, so I'll go with that. But they just need to get six points, minimum. It's an odd week because of that Tampa game, like you said. It's going to be a game where I think the Flames aren't going to do that well, and I can see that just because of knowing how this team plays, I can see that affecting their performance next night in Florida. I could see that too. So, And then they I got an the afternoon f- game in Carolina, and we don't usually do well in Carolina too. So, Well, and that combined with the fact I think their heads are going to be elsewhere in that game. It's a 1 p.m. game, and after that, I bet a lot of guys are leaving to go on vacation. Probably have the family ready to go because that's the bye week, so I don't think their heads are going to be there in Carolina. Yeah, like this could be a disastrous week if they're not if they're not paying attention to the details. And I think of all the weeks we've looked at, this has this is the week that has the possibility to be a great success or a great disaster. Like it can flip on a dime this week. Yeah, like they could walk out with zero points this week, and I could see a situation where that could happen. It's just they really need six. Just to- With what we're seeing recently, I think we're going to see the Flames beat Minnesota. I think they have to beat Minnesota, and I think the way they've played lately, they can definitely do that. Tampa Bay, I think we're going to lose. Um, I think Riddick will be in in Florida, and I think we're going to lose it just because I think the Flames aren't going to have their heads on straight for the after the Tampa game. And I'm expecting, I hope not, knock on wood, but I'm just expecting the Flames don't put in a good effort against Carolina because their heads are looking towards the bye week and Carolina gets the best of it. So I think we're going to get two points. Just the Minnesota game. Uh, well, I hope I'm wrong. I hope but that I just, you're wrong too. And like honestly, I could see you being right. And it should be a game where we can pick up, I would say, four easy points. Two points against Minnesota we'd have to fight for, and the Tampa Bay game to me is a big loss. Well, it's one of those where I'm expect I'm hoping for two points out of the four between Minnesota and Tampa. I think if we lose to Minnesota, we beat Tampa. Or I hope we beat Tampa. But yeah, it none of them are gonna be easy games just due to circumstance so i'm hoping the flames will play well in florida and if they play well in florida they can beat the panthers but i just think no matter who that team was in the 14th no matter what time it was their heads just aren't going to be in it yeah i think that the flames put it this way if calgary plays like the calgary flames can play they could sweep the week and go on a seven game oh, win for streak. sure I don't know about sweeping. I think that they'll still lose to Tampa Bay either way, but then they get six points. Well, they could beat Tampa. if They're a good enough team where man-on-man, they could beat them. It's just, is that going to happen? I don't know. I don't think so, but it could happen. Yeah, I mean, just realistically, I'm kind of looking at the best they're going to do out of this week is Minnesota, Florida, and Carolina wins. Yeah. And you're right. If they're playing it the the way they have been playing, they can probably beat, could beat any of these teams. I don't think they will beat all four of them. But knowing the way this team plays, we'll probably get good play in Minnesota. They'll probably come in and play the first, I'm going to say, half the game well against Tampa and then fade out. I think they're going to go into Florida going, oh, this is a bad team and just not be on their game and continue that in Carolina. That's my prediction. Uh and I'm going to make a bold prediction, like I said earlier, and say the Flames play Riddick in Carolina as well. I think it's a good time to kind of start shifting Smith off with the week coming up on the bye right after that. But we will talk to everybody after this one. We do have a poll for you for this week. Uh, we want to ask you guys, what do you think is going to happen with the Air Murray Auger? We gave our thoughts earlier. But, you know, the Yager experiment, I think, undoubtedly is coming to an end, and it's a matter of what happens here. The options for this week are, does he stay as an active flame through the remainder of the season and play as many games as he's healthy to? Does he get traded to another NHL team for very little or nothing? Does he retire from North American hockey as a flame? And I'm going to throw in there before the Olympic break. Do the Flames just place him on the IR for the rest of the season and he rides off into the sunset? Or 
Do the Flames trade him back to the Penguins for nothing? And he retires there this season. So we want to know what you think is going to happen with Yager. Um, especially with the bye week coming up, I actually wouldn't be surprised if this deal, whatever it's going to be, is done by the time the Flames take the ice again after the bye week. I can see it. So, Matt, you enjoy these uh, this week of Flames hockey, and we'll talk to you while the Flames are off. Yep, and thanks for listening, everybody. Have an excellent week, and as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.